Welcome to the Non-Essential Podcast. I'm Steve Gibson. I am Ben Matlock. I had to think about that for a second. Like, who am I? <laughs> and like, sadly, really? not in the deep. F- yeah, not not in that way. I was just like, I'm. I don't know my name. Welcome I'm, to I'm, the non-existential podcast, where we're really trying to get to <laughs> break down who we are, one episode at a time. Can I use that excuse that everybody uses when you ask for their like phone number? And they're like, oh, no, I never call myself. Like, well, I never call myself by my name, so I don't know what it is. <laughs> I am me, the <laughs> one and only. Um, I'm going to apologize uh, right out the gate for my audio this week. It might be a little fuzzy or whatever. We're dealing with a uh, hellscape heat wave where I'm at. And so. I'm going to apologize right off the bat for my bad jokes. Well, that's not, that's mighty kind of you, Steve. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so I, I have some air conditioning running and it's a... We didn't want Ben to die in the middle. Well... I didn't want Ben to die. Your your guys' opinion, I don't know. It's the internet, but yeah. Well, <laughs> now that you put it that way, I kind of want to turn it off and be like, it would probably be our best episode. <laughs> like, hear someone die live on air, slowly too. Slowly. Like just that. Like yeah, as the delirium sets in from the from the heat. Uh, yeah. So, so uh, if you haven't heard the non essential podcast before, it's me and Steve get together every week and talk about some stories whether they're fact or fiction or myth or history or whatever the fuck we feel like it's uh, the potpourri category of jeopardy except in like podcast form like yeah it could be anything I, we do have trebek he'll be here in a little mo- in a moment to tell us how what dumb we are false he actually knows all of our stories before we do right uh, <laughs> and he'll make that's you- what i i I like to think of all of our listeners as like Trebekian too, where because our stories, you know, a lot of the stuff I, I I at least can speak for myself. I just find things that are really interesting, and we generally only have like a week to to put a story together because we're not we're not doing like <laughs> PBS love- behind the scene like. I'm going to go interview the survivors of the survivors' family members. and I love you know, this whatever. idea that we're using an entire week. It's usually like a day. <laughs> yeah, right. So my point is we, we pull it, and I do, like, source everything, but it's the Internet, too. So, like, you know, and, and a lot of the stories that I, like, I gravitate towards are, like, the fantastic stories that you know have been exaggerated over the years. Right. And so, you know, there's, I, I like to think that there's listeners out there that hear the episode and they're like, that's not fucking true. Yeah. Like, a, lo- a lot of my, enough. a lot of my shit is a, an amalgamation of shit. I find off Wikipedia and like stuff. That's like, you find articles about it, but it has just as much like validation. You can tell that the articles it. just wrote <laughs> off of the wet Wikipedia. Like, right. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah, but my th- my thoughts are if I can find it in two or three different places, then good enough for the show. If I find so. it, if I think it's entertaining enough, I don't give a shit if it's true. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I go into every week. So let's go into something this week. Um, we're we're going to talk about a Mormon today, a very a very special Mormon. Um, one of the earliest followers of the Church of Latter Day Saints was a Benjamin F. Johnson. Uh, He dutifully followed the church teachings, but he also practiced polygamy. Um, When the church officially renounced polygamy, Johnson and many more Mormon fundamentalists continued to practice it regardless. Uh, We're not actually talking about Benjamin Johnson today. That was a weird intro then. It's it's important. Um, In 1924, Johnson's grandson, uh, one Alma Dayer LeBaron, senior moved his family to mexico and started a settlement where polygamy was really fucking low on the government's list of priorities alma believed that his grandfather benjamin was the rightful successor to joseph smith uh the well-known founder of the church and that it was alma's birthright to succeed him uh we're not actually talking about alma today uh (laughs) one, one unexpected problem with polygamy is that the whole successor thing isn't very straightforward when you have 20 fucking children with 10 different women Um, right and that's a conservative number yeah right so when all in fact it's the same uh, sorry i didn't know go for it but but that we talk a lot about like old uh european history where you get into kings and the same damn deal that's why every time a king died they'd be like well so and so a successor but this person said that they deserved it and this person yeah same thing yeah so successor thing will come up a lot here and it, it, it especially as convoluted as it got in like medieval times it's even worse when you have this many legitimate children and then just you have people in your organization saying like nah it's me 
I, I heard from <laughs> I heard from God. I'm in charge. Right. Um, so when Alma died, several of his sons claimed to be his true successor. In 1955, one son, a Joel LeBaron, founded the Church of the Firstborn of the Fullness of Times. I'm not sure why hmm. churches have these clusterfuck names. Like, yeah, like the Church yeah. of basically Mormon shit, but we think polygamy is real cool too. <laughs> rolls off the tongue just as well as their shit. So I... Um, so Joel started the church, and his brother Ervil became his second in command, having full authority over their settlement, which they called Colonia LeBaron. We're talking about Ervil today. Colonial LeBaron sounds like one of those Colonia, Colonia. Sorry, Colonia LeBaron. It's like one of those like day spas that's trying to be fancy, but you go there and like the snack package is like a saltine <laughs> cracker with it's some, like, like sweaty cheese. It sounds like a boxed wine to me <laughs> um so 12 years after founding the church of full fucker weird shit party time tensions were rising between joel and ervil ervil was advocating for the return of the mormon principle of blood atonement which basically meant the death penalty of actions ervil deemed to be crimes joel thought that was a dumb idea because it is a dumb idea because ervil was real dumb uh, they were also arguing over another Mexican colony they had, which Joel intended to have support uh, tr different church, church recruits, uh, but Ervil randomly wanted it to be a resort. Um, oh, there we go. Yeah, so clearly on the same page. Uh, Ervil began preaching against his brother, accusing Joel of crimes against their faith and proclaiming himself to be the true successor to his father, Alma. Which is really scary when you also believe that anybody that's... Should die. Yeah. yeah right, right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it could stop there. He believed anybody should should die at any <laughs> point. Uh, Ervil began the Church of the Firstborn of the Lamb of God, which, when you break it down, just sounds like the Church of the Baby of the Baby of God. Um, right. Baby. Some of Joel's followers, including uh, a name that is con constantly comes up in this story, is the Chinoweth family. Um Basically, that's like a just a pack of like various er wives and in laws to Ervil. So if I read off various names and don't touch back on them, they were probably in that family. Uh, they kind of became the an important tool for Ervil. Um, and in 1972, Ervil proclaimed his brother should be put to death and quickly orchestrated his murder. Two assassins, go. two assassins attacked Joel, and he was killed. Eventually, killed. Like they beat the shit out of him, and then shot him in the head. Um, one assassin, a Daniel Ben Jordan, was caught, uh, but released when witnesses were too afraid to testify. The other assassin remained free. Joel's followers, rather than flocking to join Ervil's shit like he expected, quickly advocated for Ervil's arrest. He did get arrested and convicted, but got freed a year later on an appeal. I don't know what that appeal was. It must have been a hell of one. Uh, it was the purge, Your Honor. <laughs> we <laughs> well, no, well, you don't understand. I, it's blood atonement. Um, <laughs> but while he was in prison, he was still writing pamphlets and books, reaffirming his position to his followers that he was the one with the authority to decide who should be killed and for what sin. Um, you'll be shocked to know that for Ervil, the worst sin you could commit was being a relative who could weaken his power and control over his cult. He became <laughs> obsessed with killing his brother Verlin, who had taken over Joel's position in the original church. Verlin went into hiding, so to flush him out, Ervil's underage 13th wife, Rina, and her brothers raided Los Molonos, where they believed he was. They began hurling firebombs and shooting at residents basically at random, killing two men and injuring 13 other people. What these lunatic dipshits didn't know was that Verlin had moved his families out of the colony to Nicaragua and wasn't even remotely there. He, like, I don't know what info they got where they're just, yeah, <laughs> fucking blow it right, up. Yeah. Uh, well, he was here once, so let's just shoot and hope. Yeah. Ervil again got arrested, but was released due to a lack of evidence. Um... Which is, this shit, like, you read this story and you're just convinced, like, justice systems don't work. We gotta, we gotta, every town needs to get a punisher. Because um, <laughs> it's just, we, we can't figure it out. No, no, no such thing as justice. Um, all this violence upset some of Ervil's followers. Uh, one was a Noemi Zarate, or Zarate, I 
don't know how that's pronounced, uh, who was the wife of a Bud Chenoweth, who was one of Ervil's 13 fucking father-in-laws. Um, and the fact that I had to, like, type a sentence like that is why polygamy is fucking stupid. <laughs> like, trying to make sense of all that shit. Like, give up the idea of in-laws if you want to have that many wives. Like, I'm father-in-law the 13th, Esquire. It's a family tree, not a fucking forest. You can't just, like, have that many branches. <laughs> um, not liking dissension, Noemi got driven out to the desert by Ervil's 10th wife, Vonda, and was murdered. Uh, they never found her body. Ervil moved some of his family up to San Diego, where he began to write letters threatening various polygamous leaders to switch their allegiance to his church and practices. One sect leader in Utah, Robert Simons, denounced Ervil after he learned Ervil intended to marry one of his wives. Um, so polygamy is like all the fun of multiple partners while retaining all that psycho-possessive jealousy that makes any right. marriage work. Um, Simons was quickly murdered under Ervil's orders. Another death in that time was that of Dean Vest, who had tried to leave the group. Uh, Ervil was upset with Vest because he wouldn't sell a houseboat and give half the profits to the church, so he had Vonda kill him in her kitchen. Uh, she got convicted for that one, but Ervil told her that her actions ensured her place in heaven, so she was all good with it. Don't you love that that's always the, like... Like, do a, go ahead and do this crime. Oh, you got caught, but don't worry. You're good in heaven. Like, we can't do shit for you now. <laughs> but but you, you, later, later you're good. You did good, Vonda. Um, two years later, Ervil ordered the death of his pre pregnant teenage daughter, Rebecca. Um, the church activities had ultimately separated Rebecca at some point from her toddler son, and the infuriated mom threatened to go to the police about the church's activities. She was killed and supposedly stuffed in the trunk of Ervil's car, which he callously drove around while he ran er other errands that day. Well, yeah, I mean, I don't always drop off my recycling first thing either. Well, you, you so, get to it when it's convenient. Supposedly, and I don't know how true this is, but uh, while he was running errands, somebody commented on the truck uh, or the car riding low, and he said it was because of Rebecca and... <laughs> like, so he wasn't even like hiding yeah, it. Yeah, he, he wasn't like... hiding it at all. Um Rebecca's mother and Ervil's first wife, Delphina, was incensed to learn about her daughter's murder, but another one of her daughters, Lillian, warned her that Delphina would be put to death if she didn't accept the quote righteousness of Rebecca's death. Believing that Lillian and her son in law were preparing to kill her, Delphina snuck out of Lillian's house with her youngest daughter and fled back to Mexico. Um, which isn't the direction I would probably go to get away from these psychos since they still right. had a presence there. But I was going to say, you'd want to stick in some place where there's at least a little bit of a like law enforcement. Well, I, like, you, you got to remember, this yeah. also was happening up in California or whatever. You would just want to get away from wherever the fuck these people have a foothold. Um, but apparently it worked and they got away. Um Ervil still wanted to kill Verlin after all this time, and he hatched a new plan to bring him out of hiding. He had his 13th wife and his stepdaughter assassinate a Rulon C. Allred, uh, leader of one of the largest polygamous sects in Utah, um, with the hopes being that Verlin would appear at the funeral. The, ass <laughs> the assassins at the funeral were forced to abandon this mission, however, when they realized police were stationed all around the area to protect the mourners. Um, turns out when someone gets killed, police keep an eye on the people around the person who got killed. Yeah, um, yeah. As cut and dry as some of these murders were, it was Allred's death that finally got Ervil. He was captured in Mexico and tried and convicted, although Reina and Ramona were acquitted. Um, that's his wife and stepdaughter. Um, so I don't know why the fuck they got off. Um, well, we got one of you. That's good enough. Well, they got the guy who planned the murder, but not the people who fucking killed him uh it's it's a really weird le yeah. legal situation this whole story um while he was incarcerated he continued to write his bullshit for his followers including lists of people he had mar marked for blood atonement he also listed his successors um Ervil died in a cell in 1981 likely an act of suicide with uh but they couldn't confirm that all they know is that he had a damaged throat um hinting at suffocation but it wasn't like he didn't just like hang himself. It would have been like he punched himself in the throat to fuck it up, well, um, which is one way to do it, I guess. Yeah. Um, I, I maybe somebody just beat the piss out of him, but 
who knows um verlin oddly enough died a few days later after his brother uh in a suspicious car crash so you know it, that poor son of a bitch he's like all right this fucker's finally dead i'm saying and then somebody cuts his brakes yeah well you know when Irville's still putting out uh, you know it could have just been an accident nothing's ever been proven otherwise right um but the fact that Irville put out like this list of fucking blood atonement and he still Don't has his the, cult out there like i know the prisons here you can you can receive and like send letters and stuff but they read them like i can't imagine the prison guards going like okay he's sending out another letter saying this person should die yeah well, yeah you would, oh, th- well. you would think this is like yeah he's putting out a hit list and sending it to his psychotic massive polygamist family um Irville died the fucking church continued on um so thank god so, oh wait no <laughs> opposite of that i love this church um so ervil the first person ervil named as a successor was his son arturo um under arturo the cult basically became a full-blown criminal enterprise uh specializing in auto theft <laughs> for jesus for jesus um ervil for ervil crime for profit wasn't unheard of god damn it cat shut up <laughs> fucking douchebag i'm in the middle of a story under ervil crime for profit wasn't unheard of but now it was an established norm um so the usual shit kind of continued on one of ervil's wives tried to leave the cold and was killed by her own son shit like that um arturo's reign didn't last long however as another follower a leo evaniuk that's a weird last name uh we'll call him just leo because he doesn't last long either um believed he had been given authority over the church just randomly i guess um after months of feuding they agreed to meet to resolve their differences arturo was murdered at that meeting so like (laughs) straight up gangster shit only with way fucking crazier people like right like you watch mob movies and stuff and it's like it's fucked up but it's like okay well it's i feel a like business. mobsters at least have some like redeeming qualities and well, these the, people seem to have none well there's like a structure and there's like a like the you, you kind of see the fucked up business mind behind everything that goes on in like mafia life um like this was all like this had that going on but it was also wrapped up in like i have divine right to kill you you know it, and i will point out for our new listeners i that i don't think mobsters have redeeming qualities but i'm just pointing out how much worse these people seem yeah um well they it's two 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 different people doing the same fucked up shit but right uh well, but I, to me, especially, I, I'm, I make no secret of the fact that I'm Christian. When you use religion in any way to like commit crimes, especially violence and murder, right? That, that's a whole nother level of like. Yeah, um, it, it was funny because like I, I, my mom listens to the show, and I, I sometimes tell her, I give her, you know, glimpses at what I'm going to talk about next week, and she's like, "Oh, don't upset Mormons," and I was like. Even Mormon, Mormons, even will, Mormons yeah, are yeah. like. That's why these are a weird polygamous cult. Like even Mormons are like, man, the LeBarons are fucked up. You know, it's not. I'm not taking shots at their faith. I'm taking shots at the people who believe in blood atonement, and I don't think that's a crazy <laughs> right. stretch. Um. So yeah, uh, Arturo got killed at that meeting. Um, many cult followers had already drifted away during Arturo's reign because it was just, well, we're just robbing cars now. Um, and by the time of his death, the cult mostly consisted of Ervil's uh, wives, children, and stepchildren. Um, after, the family. Yep. Uh, after Arturo's death, next in line was uh, Heber LeBaron, who, and these are some fucking names, man. Irvel, well, when you have Heber. 478 kids, you kind of start running out. You just make noises. <laughs> Add R's to shit. Like, that's apparently all their names are. <laughs> um, and he re- he was way more into Irvel's blood atonement shit than uh, Arturo. And now, since uh, Arturo was dead, he had a direction for it. Clear shot. Yeah, yeah. revenge. Um, so the assassins believed to be responsible for Arturo's murder were killed. And the two sisters of those assassins, who happened to be wives to Ervil, uh, vanished without a trace. Leo, Arturo's rival, who set up that meeting, was also murdered. 
Heber wasn't much of a proselytizing leader, but he was fully into polygamy as a tool of influence and control for both his cult members and by pimping out his sisters and wives, controlling Mexican mm. politicians to get cover for his criminal enterprises. I'll trade you two sisters and a daughter for a <laughs> cousin of a the mayor of, I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I almost feel like it's insulting to use the southern... <laughs> voice i know i don't know where it came from for, i'm just like, having these fun with people it. who are like way weirder than anyone <laughs> i've ever heard of um so yeah he, he it kind of you know gave him some uh leverage against politicians um and heber would end up taking Irville's wives and children with him to eventually establish another auto theft ring in the u.s with the other half of his family remaining in mexico uh following Irville's blood atonement list uh Possibly the most famous murderous act of the church occurred in June 27th, 1988, where cult assassins, including Heber himself, killed four people in three different locations in Texas in the span of just a few minutes. So four people, just for being on Irville's, Irville's arbitrary shit list, got murdered uh, in three they, like, separate coordinated, spots. They're like, coordinated, though. Yeah, so they called this the four o'clock murders, because around four o'clock, three people got dropped in three separate areas. Um, Heber and his four siblings were arrested a few weeks later for auto theft. Uh, you would think after a famous assassination, like this was all over the papers, you would want to lay low on the smaller crimes, but they're fucking dumb. Well, it, it seems to be a pattern here. That's the other problem. Once you start to believe that your terrible actions are like divinely like guided, you don't view you. you th they literally think that they're like doing things the right thing so they're not hiding from i mean obviously they're not like killing somebody in front uh, yeah, of a police officer yeah but if but you want to keep doing shit you, you like you know there's like a cause and effect thing of like the, the cops will arrest you that might interfere with all this other shit you're trying to do um, in fairness up to this point it's only might been like a minor inconvenience <laughs> for these people true very true um so Heber and his four si siblings were arrested for the auto theft, and another assassin was rounded up um, a little bit later. This brother, Richard, pled guilty for his role in the murders and agreed to testify against Heber and his other siblings. Bold move when when yeah. you're testifying against someone like that. Yeah, because he can just write on some fucking toilet paper that, like, God told me to kill him. Right. This led to their convictions, but two of the other LeBaron siblings, uh, who had been indicted for planning the murders, escaped and were not found. And his story kind of ends here on a bit of an eerie note. So there were six younger children of uh, Irville's family. Um, it should be mentioned, Irville had over 50 children. Um, it, it, it's impossible to... He's fucking yeah. everywhere. I was gonna say, with all the like crimes and stuff, it's amazing to me that he still found the kind of time to just like screw that off. Just like, fuck so all basically, the time. his life was just murder and sex. Yeah, like, maybe at the same time. I don't know. Yeah, probably at the same time. It seemed like they were all fucking freaky into it. Um, so six of the younger children of Irville's family were placed into separate foster homes in Utah after these incidences in the hopes that these kids would be deprogrammed from the criminal organization and cult. Um, in an eerie, tragic end of the story, all those children vanished from their foster homes in a single night on September 1989. They don't know what cool. became of cool. them. Uh, and that's that's basically the story of the LeBarons. They're, and they're fucked up Didn't they goddamn like polygamy go church. Didn't they go on to like, give up crime and murder and polygamy and like don't they make frozen pizzas now? <laughs> the, the Red Baron. <laughs> the Red Baron Church. Uh, yeah, it, I, you know, it's one of those things where it's like the family was so big, I'm sure there's still probably, you know, a technical church, and I'm sure they there's still probably uh, relatives who are still engaging in some illegal shit. The only thing that kind of helps there is you get to the point where, like you said, by by later in it, it was basically just his family left because everybody yeah. else is like, wait. And to be fair, and a then, lot of people left, like even uh, like, you know, the underage 13th wife, she eventually just kind of split off and like just started like, ra raising her family. Being married at 13 was all right, but murdering, that's where I draw the line. Well, <laughs> well that, she didn't I draw mean, the line there. She 
Oh, that's true. She she was in yeah. on it, uh, but she was like, "Well, I got kids now. Time to <laughs> time to move on." Yeah, got to mature. But uh, but that that problem tends to take care of itself because you run out of outside enemies because you killed them all or they got away, and then you start fighting amongst yourselves and you just start picking each other off one by one, and then yeah. So I'd like to imagine that there's just two of them left right now, and they're just like taking pot shots at each other you know any <laughs> that's one thing if you're that crazy to believe that uh somebody has divine right to murder someone you're crazy enough to believe that you got divine right to murder them <laughs> so it, it's just this weird like i you know this was the first story i've really come across for the show where i was like i i typed up all my all my notes and put like the story together and i was just like taken aback for like a few minutes of like holy shit like this story just would not end. Like, end. <laughs> like you think after ervil has gone, like they like it would go away, but like no, it, it had the full fucking crime family arc of like yeah, two more kids have to take charge and fuck it up even more before it finally burns down. Well, and the one kid kind of only slightly believed in murder, and then the other kid's like, no, murder's really important. Well, the, the first kid believed in murder, but he was like, you know what's really cool? Stealing cars. I love Fast <laughs> and Furious. Um, <laughs> and then the other kid's like, yeah, but, you know, killing people's fun, too. Can't we do both? Um, no, well, then I'll kill you. Then Damn I'll it. kill you. <laughs> yeah, it didn't say if Heber was in on it, so who knows? Yeah. Interesting. Hard to hard to follow because it's like oh there is this person now they're dead a lot of, now, a lot of names person. and most of them aren't important the the ones that are important are really like uh, Irvil Joel uh, Arturo and Heber um, I like to think that uh, shit you just said it and I, now I already forget the one that died in prison um, Irvil Irvil I kept wanting to say Emil because that was like the name of a guy last week but Irvil. I'd like to think, you know, they said, oh, his throat was crushed, but it looked like maybe he punched him. So maybe God was just like, you know what? Fuck you. <laughs> and karate chopped him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah man, if, if, if that's how, like, I, I've said it before on shows, but I'm not particularly religious. Um, but, like, if people were just randomly, like, dying from karate chop wounds that the police couldn't Lernixes, solve. Yeah. It's like, yeah, all right, maybe there is something to this whole blood atonement thing. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, that's what I got this week. Interesting, and like a really fucked up kind of <laughs> way, which is perfect for our show. <laughs> um, I've got somebody, and, and she's fairly well known, so I think a lot of people have had heard of her before. And I, the name was familiar to me, but then like I got to reading about it, and it's like... Something that we probably touched on for 30 seconds in history class that probably deserved a lot more time than that. Um, but she's a, I'll say this week it was, it was nice doing notes about somebody that's a badass instead of a bad asshole. <laughs> like, she's good. She's not like, I've done a lot of stories about people that were just awful people or awful things happening to regular people. And this, this woman's pretty awesome. So we'll um, see you next week, folks, because <laughs> we know the internet loves that's a lovely. good good person story good, good person story but uh and, and before i start we kind of already touched on it a little bit but uh i want to say that a lot of the details of this person's life are a mix of like inferences first-hand accounts that have been passed down like over time so there's been multiple retellings and folklore she, like reaches into like folklore status so we're adding um, another retelling another here thing <laughs> right and I, so i used to like a number of different sources and I tried to just like stick to the things that were most consistent between them or the most plausible sounding but it's one of those things where you'll get multiple uh, and there's a couple times I'll go into the multiple different versions of, of what happened um, but it's one of those shows like a lot of my, my stuff where it's more like uh, based on based on actual events than actual events uh, but that no no way takes away from how much of a badass this person was so uh, Mary Fields was born in Tennessee, but uh, she was been born into slavery, and she was never exactly sure, like, when. Uh, they shockingly did not keep great details, personal details about slaves. They they kept track of them by numbers, but not things like their names or where they were born or when. Um, apparently, there was two possible dates, one in ni- er, 1832 and one in 1833, 
and she never really seemed to feel the need to press the issue. Instead, she simply celebrated two birthdays every year. Nice. So, yeah, that's that starts off telling you how smart. And <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't fucking. I, right. I wouldn't touch it's it. Like, a lot of people are buying you to know where I'm from. She's like, fuck it, two cakes. Take it. <laughs> cakes for everyone. <laughs> Um, not much is known about Mary's early life because, like I said, as a slave, there is very few records um, kept of her time in Tennessee. But we do know that she was a physically imposing person by any standards uh, at over six feet tall and a broad 200 plus pound frame. Um, she had a quick temper, but a kind heart, and she was not afraid to stick up for herself. Uh, it, it, she managed her like stubborn um I never even like came up with a good word for it, although there's probably a thousand. I just, as a writer, I suck with words. But her personality is one of those where it was real strong, but it was one that tended to endear itself. Like she, a lot of people liked her, even though she <laughs> seemed like a handful. Carried herself um, confidently, right? And then people are drawn to that. Uh, after abolition in the 1860s. Uh, and, you know, that's a complicated issue. But uh, she worked her way north, eventually ending up in Toledo, Ohio, where she took a job at the Ursuline Convent of the Sacred Heart, which is why I kind of was laughing when you were talking about church names <laughs> and yours. It's like, yep, I got them, too. <laughs> um, so it's unclear exactly what led her up, you know, to this convent. But the most common theory, the one I've, I found... Uh, more consistent was that she followed the daughter of an in-law of the family that owned her as a slave uh, who had become a nun and apparently like specifically asked Mary to come with her. Like, I guess the two were kind of close and Mary decided to come up there and, and take a job with her. Um, I <laughs> made a note of this. I'm most certainly not qualified to speak of how difficult it must have been to be an independent black woman in a world where women's roles and race relations were in such a state of change, but where people's shitty attitudes towards the topics were or are still prevalent. Um, but what I can say is as hard as it must have been, Mary was harder by far. Uh, it said that the first thing that she asked for upon arrival at the convent was a strong cigar and some liquor. So, yeah, let's get fucked right. up, man. <laughs> yeah, apparently Mary really liked her whiskey. Hell yeah, uh, that was dude. one of the things that everybody knew about her. And and, and you got to take into account, like it's like, yeah, I, I, that sounds cool. Well, again, this is in the eighteen hundreds when, like, women weren't re generally allowed to like drink in public. And she's like, fuck that, I want my whiskey and a cigar. And they're like, but you're at a convent with a bunch of nuns like i don't fucking care i'm going to throw my whiskey on you and then light the cigar and you <laughs> <laughs> unless you give it to me unless you give it to me now yeah, right so uh, she worked at the convent but she was certainly not a nun herself she just worked there um aside from the cigars and the booze she was known to have a quick temper a crude mouth and often carried a revolver under her work apron fucking um, great <laughs> right this is the start of uh, a movie but my it says many of the uh, at the convent, the nuns and students alike were afraid to cross her. You know, <laughs> they didn't they were didn't want to piss her off. Uh, one of the quotes that I found that I really loved was it, it's really simple. But it just said uh, one of the nuns said, God help anyone who walked on the lawn after Mary had cut it. So I can just imagine her doing all this physical work and like you get the lawn looking nice and a student comes like skipping along it. And she's like, I'm going to fucking kill you. No, no yeah, it's like, oh, my God. Hang on. I'm flipping. Right. I'm flipping on her. Fuck that. Like. You cut the lawn, lawn. It's, it's fucking grass, all right? Fuck. But it's the 1800s. There was, fun was illegal in 18. Any it's kind not, of thing it's that not could about be... fun. It's, it's about it's, <laughs> it's the ground. You walk on the ground, you fucking authoritarian <laughs> fuck. <laughs> She's but, insane. Yeah. It, it's wrong to consider her mean. She was just very particular <laughs> and as she was actually like i said greatly respected at the convent for her work ethic because she yeah there's she a, is like there's a lot of pains in the asses who moved on up the, up the corporate ladders <laughs> well that's Good what's funny her. is it said that like everybody was afraid to cross her but all the nuns loved her like i bet because they, they were probably just as psycho well, about true, rules too. too i'm with the kids on this one <laughs> the kids. Well, when Mother Amadeus, who, you know, ran the convent, um, and who was actually the one that most of the story said that she followed up from Tennessee, we, we don't know for sure, but we do know that they were, they had grown close and that Mother Amadeus was the one that, she actually had a second name too that was harder to say, so I dropped it off. <laughs> but anyway, 
yeah I'm, I'm learning over all these episodes i'm surprised uh, you you branched far enough to get amadeus amadeus <laughs> well i did that specifically so all week once the show goes up i'll be sitting here going amadeus amadeus no yeah, that's what i'm doing but now. uh Right. You can't not do it. But anyway, she was called by the bishop to move west uh, to Montana and start a mission for Native American girls, which is one of those things most stories make it sound like, oh, you know, a mission to help convert the Native American girls. That's so nice. It's like, no, that's one of the gross things that we did. <laughs> but <laughs> whatever. Yeah. Um, but, but Mary stayed behind. Uh, but soon after she moved out there, Mother Amadeus uh, got fell ill with pneumonia and so mary did leave to join her uh she wanted to make sure she could nurse her back to health um and once mother amadeus recovered mary took a job out there hauling materials from the town of cascade montana to the mission it was about a 15 minute or 15 minute 15 mile journey between the town and this mission that was like out in the middle of nowhere um she was helping construct the uh the building and whatnot you know just various she's basically um like a handyman yeah um it was during one of these trips that uh mary's horses became spooked by a pack of ravenous wolves and the horses scattered and overturned the cart uh, and as the legend goes mary spent the entire night protecting the supplies from the hungry wolves which she fended off with her shotgun and revolver so <laughs> One of the accounts I read said she even she put her back to the to the wagon so she had cut so they couldn't you know get her from behind and she just fucking sat there and shot and like pistol whipped these wolves to keep them away from the food and then once daylight came she rounded up her horses and continued on her merry way. Um, she quickly earned the same reputation with the townsfolk of Cascade that she had with the nuns of the mission, and that's to say that people in town feared her for her temper and knew not to cross her, but they also loved her company and had a deep respect for her. Um, for a woman who loved to drink as much as Mary did, it was a bummer that it was illegal for women to drink at all in saloons, uh, unless they were prostitutes, which Mary was not. Um, Fortunately, Mary was so well liked that the mayor himself expressly gave her permission to drink anywhere she damn well chose, which is pretty fucking cool. When you get a mayor to come out and be like, "You know what? Drinks anywhere you want." I guess, but it just like if you're if it you're is, gonna be that laid back about her, then why not just be? You know what? This is dumb. Right. I mean, it, it's it's both like a cool story for her and also a good example of the times of how like backwards things were. Yeah. Um, <laughs> By all accounts, Mary wasn't there to cause trouble, but she certainly never shied away from it. Uh, if you can imagine a hard-smoking, whiskey-swilling black woman living in... She was the only black person in this town. She might have been the only black person in Montana, jeez. But <laughs> she was definitely the only black woman or black person at all in this town of Cascade. And she was a woman, and she had these, you know... People liked her, so she'd get these exceptions... But occasionally, you know, ignorant people would come through and not take kindly to the fact that there was a black woman drinking in a saloon, for instance. Um, Mary, being over six feet tall and over 200 pounds, never had to spend much effort to, like, knock these guys out cold. Uh, in fact, when she, would, when she did die later in her obituary, they had printed that she had had to have broken more noses than any person living in Montana. Uh, so I just love like thinking about some like person passing through town that's not familiar with her, and of course, an ignorant racist asshole. Like, what's this black woman doing in here? And she wouldn't even say anything. She just punch him in the face and knock him out. Well, that was, and you know, uh, you, you, which is you, what they you deserve. Should, right? That's not right. You should engage in a civil discourse with that that's man. Cool. <laughs> and <laughs> and. The fact that she was known to just, like, knock these fools out but not get arrested for it tells you, like, how much... A, she never seemed to just, like, be the aggressor and act out of, you know, nothing. And B, the people respected her. Um, she Her hard work earned her a decent wage, but uh, one of the mis mission's male janitors found out that she was making more money than him... And so he began going around town complaining to anybody he could find that no black woman should ever be paid better than he, you know, as a white man. The fact um, that you would go around and complain about that is like proof that you should get paid less than, the, per than, the, than the person <laughs> right. that everybody likes. 
Right. Like you're well, Mary ass. found out about him going around and complaining about this, and it didn't go well for the male co-worker. Uh, Mary challenged him to a pistol duel behind the chapel. chapel. Hell yeah, dude. And Fuck him up, Mary. All three of them you're seeing, because you're probably sloshed, but... <laughs> and the gentleman stupidly obliged. I, I imagine by this point, if he was going around town complaining, and she walks up, and she's the kind of person that would confront him in front of everybody. You know, not one of these, yeah, like, pull him aside. And so at this point, he's probably like, fuck, but I can't back down now, so yeah, yeah, we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll do a pistol duel. That's right, I'm white, I can't uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna learn you a thing or two, woman. Um, there's three different accounts to how this, the standoff went. Uh, the first one says that the two engaged in a heated argument and simply drew their weapons and pointed them at each other and threatened to shoot, but there were no shots fired. Another says that the duel did occur, and Mary not only escaped injury, but shot the janitor square in the ass. So I imagine, like, I'm picturing the janitor firing first and missing, and then going, oh, fuck, <laughs> and, like, turning to run away, and her just, like, shooting him in the ass. I, I, like, then, I like that one. So that yeah, means that's probably yeah. the one that didn't happen. Well, the third one's not even really so much a, an account. It's making the sly uh, implication saying, nobody knows exactly what happened, but we know that Mary Field survived. Like she killed the dude. Uh, I don't think that one's very. <laughs> no, that, <laughs> that one's probably not that very. Be, uh, you know, like dude went off to like neat for the duel, and then Val Kilmer appeared and shot him in the head. And uh, wait, that's Tombstone. <laughs> so, yeah. I, that one I think is probably the least likely because as much as people liked her, murder tends to be one of those things that they don't just go, "Well, that's Mary." Yeah, but uh, I don't know. They seem to be like, well, that's Mary for a lot of shit here. <laughs> um, well, that's where this goes. Like, regardless of how it actually went down, gunplay on church grounds was the final straw for the mission's bishop, who never really cared for her much to begin what with. What the fuck? You let her carry one forever, you think? Well, apparently... <laughs> It's a, it was one of these deals where it sounds like this mission was run like all by women, but then there's some bishop off somewhere in some other office. It's like this is my outfit. I just don't do shit now for you it. You hold on a second there. This is my god, <laughs> right? But uh, apparently, this bishop never really much liked that Mary was hanging around the the nuns anyway. And apparently, he thought that a gunslinging, foul mouth, whiskey drinking ass kicker was a bad influence on nuns. Um, so he forced them to fire her. Uh, after losing her job at the convent, or mission, whatever, um, Mother Amadeus helped Mary open a restaurant in town, and when that restaurant failed, she helped her open another restaurant for some reason. Um, take, both ventures failed. Yeah, like, you'd think you would just help her keep the first one open instead of being like, well, that didn't work, let's reopen another one. But <laughs> Time for whatever. a grand reopening. But they both failed, but it wasn't because of Mary's lack of effort or lack of support. The problem, as it turns out, is that Mary would feed anybody that came in and was hungry, regardless of whether or not they could pay. So that's kind of the cool duality of Mary Fields. It's like she's this big woman that like stood up, could stand up for herself and kick anybody's ass if they like wronged her. But at the same time, if like a starving kid came along or even just a dude that's like Somebody's out of money just fucking hungry You're just she'd feed him even though it fucking ran her out of business twice yeah so and that's why it, great restaurants should be a public good <laughs> right free food for all it just makes it hard to pay your employees and owners well, and no, you, stuff, you but... tax that shit instead of like trying to fund a goddamn dipshit space military force how oh, about yeah. we you, how about we just <laughs> we have people yeah we have great restaurants so at the time the u.s postal service was a little different than it was today uh they were a lot less semi trucks and a lot more kevin costner's um he he did the postman didn't he or something like that i don't fucking i wrote know. the kevin joke costner and I didn't... always does kevin costner and everything Just stuff so yeah. it's like did he i wrote do the joke that? but I... didn't bother to like research it so i think the joke works i'm going with it well you tell me Mail did he play kevin costner <laughs> kevin costner oh but he he standed in it standing stood in a field and looked wistfully over the greens yeah kevin costner danced with wolves as kevin costner and for four hours uh, yeah it's like he's he'll do other shit but it's it's all the same man same Right. I've never sometimes been like, wow, he's Civil transcended. War, sometimes he's, right. <laughs> and now he's playing golf in this movie? My God. What a method actor. 
<laughs> anyway, mail delivery between hubs was often subcontracted subcontracted out in what they called star routes. Uh, at the age of sixty, and now unemployed, Mary decided that she'd apply for one of the for the uh, actually the exact the fifteen mile route between uh, the town of Cascade and out to the mission where she had been working. Um, she won the job by being the fastest person to hitch six horses at age 60, which is kind of cool. Uh, and it made her only the second woman ever to have one of these routes. And of course, the first African-American woman to have one of these routes. Uh, that's where she eventually earned the nickname Stagecoach Mary, which is what she's probably more well known as. Uh, she had Mary Field, Stagecoach Mary, and then her other nickname was Black Mary it's like, that seems a little too on the nose to be, like, clever. I wonder but... if that's a whiskey brand now. <laughs> Should be. Like, I'd like to think she'd come back from the grave and endorse it. Like, yeah, I fucking like whiskey. I'd like a whiskey named after me, as long as I can drink it anywhere I want. I'm looking it up but... right now. Please continue. <laughs> she got the name because of her reliability and speed. Uh, I did see it pointed out, though, that neither during her time with the Postal Service or back when she was hauling materials for the mission did Stagecoach Mary drive a stagecoach. She, she was, of course, using a, a wagon, but uh, the name Horse Cart Mary probably didn't have the same ring to it, so I I, I kind of think they make the right choice. You can take some artistic you know, license there. No Stagecoach um, Mary whiskey. That's No? That's, that's depressing. A, what about, and I'd assume no Black Mary whiskey. <laughs> But uh, yeah, that would, that would probably go over well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, it's said that Mary never missed a day, and that even when snow prevented the horses from traveling, she'd carry the fucking mail on her shoulders using snowshoes. Which at first it seems like, well, that's kind of badass, and you think, well, the route was fifteen miles. Like even some of the most experienced like day hikers, fifteen miles in a day is pretty well pushing it. Um, granted, she's not going like up mountains and stuff, but. At that point, you're going through deep snow that requires snowshoes. So <laughs> that's pretty badass. Um, and not to mention at the time, you know, this now you're, you're getting out of the we're out of the 1800s or the early 1900s. But we're also out in the, you know, open west. Uh, mail carriers had all sorts of hazards on their routes from bandits and thieves to, you know, animals and just various like shit that you can come across. The roads washed out or whatever tornado she probably punched a tornado in the face too it's like get the fuck away i got mail to deliver <laughs> yeah she just um, blew it away <laughs> but uh she retired from the postal service in her 70s and ended up on, opening a laundry service back in the town of cascade jesus christ and, dude <laughs> yeah she never quit <laughs> skills everything except <laughs> restaurants apparently or <laughs> right <laughs> too generous for restaurants but that's what's funny, too, is you get to some of these other and they say, oh, her business acumen. And it's like, well, except for restaurant. And again, though, that's where, you know, she knew that it was bad business, but she just couldn't let Didn't people go. Shit, yeah, like, right. Because underneath her, like, hard exterior, she cared under, about under, people. Underneath all, you know, she cared way too much about grass, apparently. But, <laughs> right. but she did that's also her list care of, about feeding people. I, I, I think her list of, like, things went God first, then grass, then people. And then whatever other stuff. But uh, anyway, one of my favorite stories I came across of her came from from this laundry service. Uh, said that she was drinking in a saloon when she recognized a voice outside uh, from the street. And it was a guy who had failed to pay his bill. He had had her do his laundry, but then he just took it and didn't pay. So she, of course, decided to confront the man. And with a single blow, knocked the guy flat on his back. Uh, it says he pin she pinned him down with one foot, refusing to let him up until he paid his bill. But the better version of the story I read says that she, you know, cocked him across the face and he knocked him flat and bit down and lifted him up by his shirt collar and said <laughs> right to his face, the pleasure I got from punching you was worth at least the $2 that you owe me. So we're even now and just let the man go. Yeah. So I, I, very I, Mary, I prefer Maryfield story in a realistic way. I prefer the first one where it's like, you know, pay your fucking bill. <laughs> but in the like the second one being like, well now we're even because I punched you is like no you're the the violence is you could learn but, something uh, from Irville and his racket because <laughs> the violence is supposed to get you what you want. Well, either way, I like to add on like I in my mind I'm going to picture the guy like 
you know, he completely shocked and gave her money or whatever. And then saying, does your laundry service get urine stains out of trousers? Well, also, if like yeah. you need to do fucking, if you need, if you're using a laundry service back then, pay the fucking money. Like you, you it's you, well, you're either a fucking imagine. bum or you probably have the money to cover that shit. You know? Well, and I got to imagine it, it, the one thing the story said you pay me the two dollars you owe me. Now that could be artistic license. It could be adjusted for inflate. Two dollars back then was a lot of money. That would be a lot of fucking laundry. Sure. Like, but I imagine you, if you're if you're going somewhere and you to get that service done, like it's not like oh, but just yesterday I was washing this shit in a bucket. You know, it was like you probably knew you had to pay like two bucks. So well, yeah. And my guess, if I had to, and maybe I'm projecting here, is that this guy had her do the laundry and said, "I'm not paying no black woman to wash my clothes." Like kind of that she should just do it on her own like i'm superior type thing and she's like yeah. fuck that yeah, it, it was it was what a lot of people who owe money stories turn into is just like not respecting the person that you took the money from or all right and even a lot of that is a mixture of not respecting them and just coming up with an excuse because you're a cheapskate yeah <laughs> so. yeah yeah it ultimately boils down to i don't want to fucking pay money which you know is a good reason to not pay money, I guess. Uh, you know, I so, we we have we we pay rent, we pay bills, and uh, you, you ever think how easy life would be if you just said you didn't have to if you didn't yeah, have to it. do that. Like, I'm not paying my mortgage this month because my bill came one day later than normal, and fuck that. <laughs> like just any excuse that you can. I yeah. I was all ready to pay it now, but yesterday, but now you pissed me off, so. I always kind of do do that, like, same, like, shitty, like, horrible version of a southern accent anytime I'm trying to do somebody That's kind of your dumbass, uh, evil man accent voice, like... So I guess now, at the end of the episode, after doing it for, like, five episodes, would be a good time to point out I am not trying to equate southerners with, like, dumb. <laughs> I am. <laughs> that I, That's just, like, the one accent that I can, like... Not southerners as a whole, but I definitely... My family from the South is dumb. And if they hear this, uh, hey, guys. Hey. <laughs> I'm not talking about you. I'm talking I'm about ta the other, I, I, other ones. No, I'm, me, I'm talking so. about you. But we'll, we'll, talk, okay. on, we'll talk on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, Mary uh, continued to be well-liked and admired around town, uh, where she would often care for children. It's like babysitting, but like for free, it sounds like. Just... Whatever the townspeople needed, she was happy to help. And she was a big supporter of the local baseball team, which is like the final straw in like, this woman's school. Yeah. Um, she died of liver failure in 1914, which is the best possible way to go out, yeah. I think, for, for Mary. I don't know. I've she was never, 80. My liver's never failed on me. It might oh, no, I mean, ass. it was probably horrible for her. But, I mean, if you're going to be, like, known as the like the woman that, like, worked hard and drank whiskey, it's like, All well, right. yeah, your liver's got to give out that... That's. I don't know. I kind of would have liked her to be like, you know, wh how old was she when she died? Uh, 80. 80. Uh, 82, 83. Like I said, they were never exactly sure when she was born. So Yeah, so, um, but I know she got up there. 70s, 80s, or whatever. Yeah. Um, I kind of wish this had like a Red Dead Redemption sort of ending where she has to like the fucking barn surrounded and she kicks open the door and she takes out like eight of them but they fucking get her because there's just too many and uh, like yeah but she runs out her her revolver runs out of bullets so she just throws her gun and kills another person with that yeah she fucking just, barehanded crashes skulls together and yeah like to me like you know that's kind of when a badass has just like oh my fucking liver hurts like it's like that sucks you deserve better okay well we can, we we can use there's some creative license I'm sure you like I said she's she's a, a true historical figure and a very inspiring one given what she went through at the time and never really let it stop her from doing what she wanted to do yeah but we can add to the folklore and say well she died of liver failure when she was stabbed by a bear in the liver like a bear who wouldn't yeah. pay his bill but she <laughs> she was still alive and she fucking like grabbed his fucking jaw in his mouth and like had his, her hands in her teeth and just like ripped his skull in half and then he sh and then she got the two bucks he owed her 
and <laughs> put it in the till and then fell over dead. From liver, liver failure. Yeah, right. So there you go. It, yeah. it doesn't specify how her liver failed. Like, it could have failed from some spectacular, yeah, like... If you want the true story on how Stagecoach Mary died, non-essential podcast coming at you. <laughs> she stopped a train with her liver, but it was just too much for the 80-year-old woman, and she, she breathed <laughs> her last breath, and it was a puff of cigar smoke. Fucking headbutt a train. <laughs> stopped it. A runaway train stopped it where it stood, but a random piece of metal came and cut up her liver. So anyway, that's what I have this week. It's kind of a, a shorter story. It, the cool thing, uh, well, everything I think is cool about Stagecoach Mary. Like, look her up and all. basically every photo that she's in, she's got her fucking rifle slung over her back and like the revolver in its holster yeah. she could she she might be playing baseball at the time but it's like nope need my my and then she never really seemed to use her guns it's like i've got them but i'm just gonna beat the shit out of you yeah i, I think like, that's you know the one thing that kind of disappoints me about it is like you I, I wanted her to fuck some dudes up for, for real like you, you, like all right this is stagecoach mary she's gonna full-blown robocop this entire goddamn montana town until she gets her two dollars when the mission was invaded by i don't know i don't want to say native americans because i hate that stereotype bandits but uh yeah bandits yeah, outlaws that's that's your go-to in any like you you just go to the like fucking magnificent seven or whatever and oh no it's black bart <laughs> yeah that's yeah yeah <laughs> Well, maybe there was a standoff like that. I would assume that they had had there been, they would have talked about it. But uh, and then the bishop would have been like, "You, you desecrate hey, the house people. of yeah. God with your well, guns." It's like, man, these guns make God better. As far as that goes, there was one other story about the bishop that I had left out um, because it was from like a cracked dot com article. And no offense, cracked dot com, but it's an interesting site. But it's not the most well like sourced and. As you can opposed tell. to the, everything else in the story, where there was like three possible things that happened in every major <laughs> event in her life. Hey, at least I hit on all three. Like a true yeah, it's a, it's podcaster, saying, like, you know, give crack their share. But uh, back at that story where the uh, the wolves attacked and she had to hold them off all night and with her guns, that was the one like gun standoff, which was semi cool. But then it's like wolves, and it's like yeah. I don't love violence against animals. Except although those wolves had hunting rifles. <laughs> yeah. And she didn't kill them. She just scared them off. She's like, you better leave me alone. And they're like, fuck, let's leave this woman alone. Still a better but, uh, wolf conflict than the ending to the gray where Liam Neeson was about to fight the wolf. And then they cut to the credits. And I was like, man, fuck what you. The? Yeah. I've, I've never seen that, but, uh, yeah. Just... If, if you're gonna sell me a movie and there's a chance that Liam Neeson's gonna fight a wolf, that was all I, get I to wanted fucking to see. Seem... Right, right. That was all. And I would sit through like a two hour movie just to see that at the end. Yeah, so. and he, and it's so set up so well. He's like breaking like like mini liquor bottles for the glass and like taping it to his hands and is like snarling <laughs> at the wolf. And you're like, shit's about to go off. And then like the fucking movie went off. And I'm like, what happened? I waited the whole movie for this moment. Ah, Peta, they ruin everything. They're like, you can't show that. It's a goddamn CG wolf, all right. And they right. and they had been fucking up people the entire movie, and it was time yeah, for this, Liam Neeson to get his wolf had it coming. Damn it! Right. But anyway, the, there was one version of that story, and it might not have been cracked, but it was one of those type of like sites that said in that episode where the the cart overturned. You know, when she drove the wolves off the next day, and righted the cart she got everything back on it and said there was nothing damaged except for one barrel of like maple syrup that cracked when it fell and leaked so they lost that and it did say that that asshole abbot made her pay for that out of her own pocket like i i like that as flavor because it makes him a worse guy but it also seemed like something that you just write to be like though the evil dean of the school he he kicked out Delpha Alpha's house. Grr. I don't know. I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. <laughs> um, he, it, it just seemed like painting him as like the quintessential '80s movie villain. Yeah. Like, 
I, I got that. <laughs> you lost me at, like, fucking Delta, Delta Alpha, Kappa I, Phi. Can you tell that I didn't go to a real university? I went to an art school that yeah, did you, not have fraternities. Hey, you didn't frat the fuck out? Mm-mm. Um, yeah. Uh, interesting, interesting woman. I'd have, I would have had a drink with her, and I probably would have said something wrong and got punched in the face. Well, I was going to say so. earlier, is like, most women I've ever met fucking drink me under the table. Like... <laughs> So the, like, well, especially so the if they're they six foot and two hundred pounds. Yeah, like. So the fact that they originally weren't going to let her in the saloon, it's like you're fucking dumb, dude. Like, well, maybe they yeah, the barkeeps had something to do with that. They're like, dude, this will get my kids through college. She likes whiskey more than anyone else in this settlement. You have got to let her in. Um, I, but I, I, I think that was a big reason why I was drawn to her and her story because it's like. I would say I can relate because she just works hard during the day and she does the right thing and then what? all she wants is to go home and drink. But I don't work hard or do the right thing. I just yeah. wait to go home and drink. So, Like any good hero, it's what you aspire for, but ultimately you're a piece of shit <laughs> and you just want to, like, you, you find ways to cut corners and then you drink and like, wow, what a day. And the best part about doing this story is I know at some point in the future... I'll have had too much to drink at a bar and they'll be like, Steve, you got to quit drinking. And I'll be like, fuck that. Have you heard of Mary Field stagecoach, Mary? Sit down. She'd say to have another. Sit down while I play you this back half of the non-essential podcast. Cause I can't tell the story anymore. Cause I've drank. You know how much. like when you're drunk, you, and I don't want to make it sound like I go get plastered all the time. I don't, I, I like to drink, but I don't, do that but every now and then you you fuck up and you have too much to drink oh yeah and when you hit that point you look for any excuse to keep drinking like you're i i i can tell you i've had a number of times where like all your friends are like passed out like dude it's 4 30 in the morning and we're drunk we're going to bed it's like no 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 Uh. remember that guy from science class in fifth grade let's we need to pour one you know for him yeah usually for me like if i ever got to the point where i threw up like that was all right that's the night uh, like that's you've gone way too fucking yes, far now yes. um but i've had friends who for them it was like well i threw up time to get back you at more it. room yeah <laughs> now we're clear. i've never that's probably my problem is i generally don't throw i can't think of a time that i threw up too much because like as i was actively drinking now there have been times where you wake up in the morning it's like yep this is coming back out because your liver's like i am not processing any more of this shit you fucker like it's going out back the way it came i don't think but, i've ever uh, actually like talked to you or like seen you at any point where you were like really fucked up because like no there's there's tweets but like that's the thing like the only (laughs) clues you ever get that i'm like really fucked up you you get like those really like i think they're funny but they're really just sort of randomly hostile like thoughts (laughs) where it's just like man fuck colonel sanders and and that's all my tweet is and that would be my problem i'd be drinking with mary and get to that point and you'd say something like that that you wouldn't even know that she had an opinion on you'd just be like yeah i fucking hate tulips and be like my mom had a tulip garden kapow to be like ow you know what i love walking on a freshly cut lawn and then you get shot <laughs> no you fucking didn't <laughs> i would actually do that just like knowingly provoke her like man walking on a freshly cut lawn especially one you've done because it's so nice <laughs> It's so, yeah, so I just love laying down and making like snow angels in the grass. Yeah, man. Pat trampled the shit out of that. Man, stupid it's ass nice. lawn. It's great. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, that's the that's the show this week. Thanks for listening again. Again, yes, we we always appreciate it. Uh, tune in next week when we'll talk about two things that weren't these two things, and. Ideally, will be two different things. Yeah, we're at every now. This is the tenth episode, but we're at twenty things. I know that's. It, we'll, we'll get to do a best of show like half as early as regular podcasts. That means we'll that, have, mean, that means by the time we get to episode fifty, we get to celebrate our one hundredth thing, and yeah. then when we get to episode one hundred, we get to celebrate our hundredth episode. So. <laughs> It's like Mary again with the two birthday cakes. We are fucking, yeah. yeah. What can we learn from Stagecoach Mary? Two cakes. Two cakes.